Does anyone recognize the title? Maze of Twisty Passages. I do. You do? Yes. Where'd you see it? A couple of times I took classes. Mm -hmm. Ah, but did a you see it? Books. Did, did you see it on the net? No. Does anybody remember a game, a computer game on the net called oh, Zork? Zork. Z O R K. Anybody? Not even Mark. Wow, that's old school. <laughs> that, that really is old school. It was, a, it was a game which was probably in the mid-70s, uh, played on machines at Information Science Institute in California. My kids played that game. They played it over the ARPANET. And so begins the adventure. First, let me understand what we're doing here. Several years ago, I and some others gave an internet technology history tutorial at SIGCOM 99 in Harvard. There were four of us, and we, in fact, talked for eight hours. We talked about the history of the Internet. That was 1999. It's been six years since then. And the Internet Archives and the History Project is at postel.org, as you see at the bottom of the slide. Now, let me play some history here. I was absolutely wonderfully fortunate at being in the right place at the right time when the, when the internet was new. It was a sandbox. There were a bunch of us. We started out with about maybe eight or ten people who knew what the word internet meant. We had all the money we could spend. We had all the equipment anybody could ever ask for. We asked DARPA at the time, the program managers, what is it you want us to do? And they said, will you tell us what you want to do? We said, how much money can we spend? They said, as much as you need. Where can you spend this money on? Any place you want. What is it you want us to do? Anything you want. In one sense, it was frustrating. In another sense, it was, it, was a, it was a great present. Now, I'm going to tell you about my part of it. It's not just my part. There's a lot more to it. So you're going to get my personal recollections my personal adventure. There were other adventures. Let's consider for a moment the internet project in and of itself. Why do you do a project like this? Well, DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and they're the ones funded by the military to do these things. So it had to benefit the military. But DARPA has a very wide uh, charter and they supported a lot of things that were useful to humanity at large, as well as the military. So in 1972, let me back to that, 1968. In 1968, I was at a conference in Pine Mountain, Georgia. It was the predecessor of what later became SIGCOM, which was a very uh, elitist computer network symposium held every year today. But the forerunner of that was in Pine Mountain, Georgia. I gave a paper there. The paper is absolutely forgettable. But on the same venue with me was Robert Kahn from DARPA talking about the first link in the ARPANET. It was between UCLA and Stanford Research Institute International. First link, 1968. This morning, a friend of mine coughed up a network map. I've got it here, but I don't have a slide because it happened this morning. It shows the ARPANET as of 1972. I will show you in a minute the ARPANET of later years. So one of the things we started off with was the ARPANET. Why did we do this? Well, the fact was that the kind of personality of people that were working on the first ARPANET were like radio amateurs. Hey, I just managed to work LCS at MIT. I got through. I managed to log in. Hey, it'll be QSL card. Or they managed to work me. My TCP works. It was that kind of adventure at that time. I mentioned on these slides, I talk about bake-offs. If you got a bunch of new protocols, a bunch of new people doing new things, they have to interoperate with each other. How do you do this? We've never done this before. How do you interoperate with your friend? Well, you get, you get, get it together in Information Science Institute, 4637 Amity Way in Marina Del Rey, California. There's a wonderful hotel there and a wonderful set of, of uh, 
Mexican uh, restaurants. I know it well. We get together there, maybe half a dozen or a dozen of us, and we get into a room like this. We get into a number of terminals. We log on via the ARPANET to our respective machines and run the protocols and try to talk to each other. It was called a bake-off. The bake-off had points. If I could log into your machine, I got a point. If you could log into my machine, I got a point. If I could crash your machine, I got two points. If you could crash mine, you got two points. And so it worked. I think the maximum I ever got was 16 points. I thought I was very, very proud of that. Hey, I got 16 points in the bake-off. But you see, the culture at that time was motivated by these points. We were the users. We were developing the technology that we were the users. So we were having fun building the radio. So that was one of the points, if you ever have to think about how do you start an internet project? How do you manage it? Who, what people do you choose? Where do you put them? What do you ask them to do? And I'd like to spend a minute here as I'm talking about this to think about the cultural environment in which the internet was launched. There's a lesson there. If we need to do projects like that at some time in the future, learn from the internet history. Learn from the culture. So, what do we think the internet was for? We wanted to talk to each other. We wanted to run a project. But I was located someplace in the wilds of Washington, D.C., which is the cultural extreme of the internet geography. Hear what I'm saying? Washington, D.C. is the cultural extreme of the geography. Nobody does anything in Washington, D.C. It's done in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or Marina del Rey, California, or Moffett Field in near Palo Alto. It's done at the research institution, and Washington, D.C. is not a research institution. So, what do we do it for? We wanted to talk to each other. We wanted to run the project. We wanted to test things. I was the first one to implement FTP, the File Transfer Protocol. Who did I talk to? I had to talk to myself. So I had to have another machine in which I implemented FTP to make sure that I could talk to myself. And so someone else implemented Telnet. How do you test Telnet? Well, at the time, we had a whole bunch of different kinds of terminals. Because the, the internet at that time was the ARPANET as a transport network connecting a number of service providers. Now think carefully what I'm talking about here. The ARPANET had a number of large, expensive machines. And that's what the ARPANET was for, to interconnect those large, expensive machines. Well, who's going to use those machines? People like me on glass teletypes. We need to be connected to the ARPANET. So the ARPANET had two kinds of switches. One of them are called IMPS, Interface Message Processor, and the other are called, I should come back to this, and the other were called Terminal Interface Processors, or TIPS. These were dial-in machines. You could dial into a TIP and then log on to an ARPANET machine. And that's how you got into the ARPANET. I'm ahead of myself. Let's talk about milestones. These slides were not part of the presentation. I added these slides for this talk today. The ARPANET history. 1968, I told you about the first paper that I ran across. At the same conference was Norman Abramson, who described the Aloha system in Hawaii. I wish I had a tape of that, of that conference, because those were two very seminal papers, very new ideas. And it was right there, 1968. But 1972, the ARPANET was uh, pretty, pretty well flushed out. UDEL was not connected at that time. But there were quite a number of hosts on the ARPANET in 1972. When I came along in 1977, is that right? 19, yeah, I came along in 1977. And at that time, the ARPANET was in its full glory. I have a slide on that, which I'll show you presently. Now, the internet project was started about 1976. The intent was to tie together the various networks at the time, ARPANET, packet radio network, satellite network. I'll speak about that in a minute. That was the intent of the internet project. We had three disparate different technologies. We wanted to tie them together. They were totally different. The satellite network was different from the packet radio network that was different from ARPANET. And that's what the internet protocol was for, 
to interconnect them in a seamless way. The development of IPTCP continued until 1979, when we had the, the what we call the Coming Up Party, National Computer Conference at that time held in Washington, D.C. in November 1979. I had a system which was called the Fuzzball, more about that some other time, which did in fact use all three technologies. And so I gave this demonstration where my friend overseas was talking in real time on the satellite, sending pictures in real time in the satellite, where we demonstrated that the IP TCP stack actually worked. What we didn't tell the observers was that the circuit was so bad across the Atlantic that my friend in, in London was reading from a prepared script and couldn't hear a word we said. <laughs> That's history. I gave a couple of talks at that uh, conference. Vince Cerf, who was then and now uh, one of the prime movers behind the, the internet, I had an overhead projector. And when I was through with my, my talk, I looked down at the projector and there was a tarantula. I mean, a full-size tarantula on the overhead projector. And I jerked back, you know. I said, what is that doing on my projector? Vince Cerf had found a plastic tarantula to tease me with. <laughs> Got my attention. So, by 1982, we thought the internet was sufficiently mature to switch, to say we are now officially the internet, and everybody speaks internet. The fact that ARPANET is behind the scenes is transparent. That was 1982. January 1st. None of us knew this actually took place because we had been running the TCP IP stack tunneled over ARPANET for about five years. I mean, it didn't matter. The internet didn't matter. It was just the transport network. So by then, 1982 was the, was the flag day. And about that, by, by 1981, we had essentially completed the protocol suite. We had everything working. There were some, some side trips, multimedia presentation, real-time presentation, speech, stuff like that. that. That worked in the background throughout the years. But by 1981, and certainly by 1982, the internet architecture was pretty mature. Well, there's a couple of things to say here that's kind of interesting. The internet was conceived in a vacuum. It was conceived as a DARPA project by and for DARPA and what they were called the arrogant ARPANOTs. That's what we were called back then. I mean, our friends in other academic institutions were scurrying for money. We didn't know how to spend the money. We had too much money to spend. There was a good deal of jealousy in the technical community at that time. And we were called the arrogant ARPANOT bastards. Well, we survived it. But a significant event occurred because at the same time, there was a considerable effort in the international standards community to promote an international standard produced by the, the, the ISO, the International Standards Organization. These guys wanted to standardize it and, quote, do it right. They had some good ideas. We ignored them. We were doing our own thing. So about then, the National Academy of Sciences got interested in this, and they said, we ought to find out whether or not we should bless the IPTCP technology or whether we should kill it and bless the ISO technology. And that was their mission. So NAS convened a panel of experts. And they met to consider the fate of TCP IP. They deliberated for about a year. And they came up with three results shown on this slide. Either kill ISO, kill IPTCP, or let IPTCP die in the sunset. They chose that option. At this time, there was something in government called GOSSIP, Government Open Systems Interconnect Project. And what this was intended to do was provide a way for the government systems to transition from the ugly IPTCP into the blessed ISO. That's why it was there. A couple of things happened. The Defense Department decided they wanted to save money. So they said, don't have any special standards. Have, have open procurement, cuts, commercial off-the-shelf cuts. And so they promoted that. Well, you could buy it for free. You could get TCP IP, but nobody built OSI standards. 
You couldn't buy it. It wasn't in the cupboard. So, of course, of course, what happened then was that OSI died and TCPIP flourished. But there's a secret here, and I'll explain this in some other talk. Along came Unix. When Unix got TCPIP, which is probably late 1982, when we had availability of Unix essentially for free, because the AT&T license had run out, and we had TCPIP, it was a killer. There was no way of any other system competing with services that provided with Unix and TCPIP. Well, that's the overview. Let's talk about the seasons in the internet development. We have the fall, the winter, and the summer, and the spring. Let's talk about the first. This is on the internet, ARPANET life cycle. Now, in the early ARPANET, was conceived as a way of connecting together service machines, big, big interactive uh, timeshare machines. I bet you don't even know what that means today. Do you know what it means to be an interactive time server machine? You say, what are you talking about? I've got one on my desk right now. All my PCs are that way. It wasn't always this way. The large service machines cost a lot of money, required a lot of fair conditioning, and were very expensive. And they had to be shared. That's why the ARPANET came into being, to provide access to these big machines. Well, something funny happened. Digital Equipment Corporation was perhaps the most in influential uh, director of computer development in the last couple of decades. Because they came out with cheap machines. Machines you could put on your desk. I had a PDP-8. I had an LSI-11. They were treasures to me. I could afford them, rather than DARPA could afford them. And so what happened was then that we started to grow local networks. I mean, an Ethernet interface at that time was $3,000. And was in a, a couple of large, expensive plug-in cards. So we, we, we couldn't quite afford Ethernets. We could afford modems. Modems, 1,200 bits per second. I developed TCP IP on my machines when I was communicating with the world at 1,200 bits per second, and that was fast. Things have changed. So the whole point was that the ARPANET started to grow into being a transport network between local networks. And after that happened, the ARPANET just withered away. We didn't need the ARPANET anymore. We had alternative uh, uh, transport on backbones. So the ARPANET was just one of those. And here we see the mature ARPANET faded to obscurity. As I pointed out in the last point, the last, last thing there, ARPANET has never died. ARPANET lives on. If you take your credit card to a local merchant and he runs it into that machine, he stripes the machine, that machine communicates with the, with the, uh, the uh, credit card authorization infrastructure by means of an ARPANET clone. That's not to say that they, teach, that they use the ARPANET protocols. They layer X25. Anybody here heard about X25? Does anyone know that they exist X25? Oh, you're a completely different generation. At one time, X25 was the only official protocol offered in this country, in Canada, France, and the UK. You wanted to buy a commercial provider? You wanted to, get, you wanted to connect your computers together? You subscribe to an X25 network. You don't want to know what that protocol is like. You'd be embarrassed. So we forget it. Let's move on. Here's what the ARPANET looked like in 1979. Over here someplace, and I can't see this clearly, is UDEL. It's there on the, on the graph somewhere. I was uh, off the miter tip, somewhere in the middle of this thing, but that's what the ARPANET looked like. Now, what I want to say here is that this is a modest size network. It was a large network for that time. It's modest sized, it's small today. But the fact was that the network topology is doubly connected. If any one link fails, there's always an alternative path. Play this back. There has to be a routing protocol that runs on this system which can recognize the fact that a link has failed and change the routing accordingly. And of course, the, this was the first experience that we had building an adaptive routing protocol, and it was a disaster. Does anyone know? about the Bellman-Ford routing parody.
some of you, I think, do. If not, don't worry about it. It's potentially unstable. If, if links fail in certain ways, it does something evil. We call it counting to infinity. Don't worry too much about that point. Just say it becomes unstable. We have much better protocols today. Shortest path first, SPF, is perhaps the best candidate of that, and there are many variations of that. We learned a very important point in the ARPANET, that the initial technology was unstable. And we had to learn, we had to deploy that, get lessons, lessons from it, uh, contrive workarounds, develop better protocols, implement them, and get them deployed. We could not do that if this was a public network. This was a sandbox. It was a plaything for the developers. And we could make major changes, inconveniencing lots of people. Sure, we had the money to spend. Here is the topology about 1983. And notice something's happened here. The ARPANET has split. Remember, this was a Defense Department project. So the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines says, what's in it for us? And we said, what you need is your own ARPANET dedicated to the military function. That was called MILNET. So the ARPANOTS had the original ARPANET to play with, but the MILNET was an operational network. Look at the connections between the two networks. Those are called the MILNET gateways. And they were an early development of a drastically imperfect architecture. I hesitate to say that because my rooting pro protocols were involved and they were evil. I'll show you in a minute about that. Well, I'm going to do something in this slide. I've got 46 slides here and I'm not going to even get near in this class to make, you know, do all the slides. So I'm going to skip these slides, but I'm saying that these are on my website. And what I'm going to say is, if I skip over some of these things and you're not quite happy with that, these slides are on the website, and they're mostly self-explanatory. Uh, One of the things we had to do was to evaluate the performance. We got this expensive ARPANET. It cost $15 million a year to run in 1979 dollars. That's expensive. So how do you justify that investment? How well does it work? And one of the things I was tasked to do was to say, how well does it work? I did a whole bunch of measurement programs, which are detailed here but I won't talk in detail. Let me say a couple of words about other networks. Packet radio. The packet radio network was a very interesting experiment. I have to say that the eventual outcome of the packet radio network probably is not, not really clear. It's not clear what valuable lessons it taught the military. The project worked. You see we had a van there. The van was run out of Stanford Research International in Menlo Park, California. I used to live there. And we put repeaters on nearby mountain peaks. Anybody here familiar with San Francisco? Well, it's a very interesting topographical uh, experience. It's mostly flat, except for a couple of peaks. We put repeaters on the peaks. We took ships in Monterey Bay. We took vans and drove around the streets of Oakland and San Francisco and experimented with the idea of mobile packet radio. The equipment was very clumsy. It was a rack of equipment in the back of a, of a, of a van. My personal experience was bouncing around the Malvern Hills in the United Kingdom, working a, a, a graphical terminal and a packet radio installation, bouncing around in a Land Rover dodging sheep, literally dodging sheep, and reading my mail in California. I thought that was cool. Nowadays you do it with your, with your cell phone. Back then it hadn't been done before. The issues involved then, what did we do it for? IP, TCP had to work bouncing around the Malvern Hills, dodging sheep in packet radio. That was the fertile ground in which we had to develop TCP IP. It had to be a four-wheel drive vehicle. TCP had to work, even if the underlying connectivity was very imperfect. And that's the lesson we learned. So packet radio with IP TCP was then the topic. We wouldn't do that today. I wouldn't advise doing TCP IP over cellular phone, for instance. 
And we'll talk about that some other time. Well, here is some ancient history. Lessons we learned. We started off with a routing protocol between gateways called the Gateway to Gateway Routing Protocol, GTP. This was a grand and glorious experiment. We had eight routers at the time scattered over the country. GTP was implemented in those eight routers and in mine. There were two implementations, one done by Bolt Baranek Newman in Cambridge, Mass., and the other by me. So the great experiment for, intercon for inter interconnection was, can we both implement a compatible protocol? Go entirely by the spec. I forget which RFC it is, but they implemented the spec, I implemented the spec, we connected together, and by golly, it worked. Except, I did something wrong. I didn't even know what I did. And I fired up the gateway, I talked to one of the BBN gateways, and I crashed it. It in turn crashed its neighbor. In turn crashed its neighbor. It wasn't too long before the eight BBN gateways and mine had totally died. The lesson I learned there was really profound. Errors like that should never be allowed to propagate. We should never build a distributed protocol system where an error in one system crashes the whole system. We got really careful in designing systems after that, designing protocols with that lesson. We are very careful to constrain the damage should a, something like that happen. Okay, we learned the lesson, right? In January 15th, 1990, the AT&T system went completely belly up for 10 hours. No telephone service in AT&T for 10 hours. It was the same problem. It was the same thing. Somebody made a protocol mistake. They put in the C language source for the switches, they got the right curly bracket on the wrong line. How many times have you done that? That was a generic problem in the, in the, in the software. All of the 114 AT&T switches had the same software with the same problem when a machine in, in, in downtown Manhattan did something weird and crashed. It exported the crash to its neighbors, went to their neighbors. Before very long, all 114 switches were belly up. My experience with GDP was maybe the first experience or something like that. It's probably not the last. So, this is how GGP was used. To give you an idea, in the early days, of how bad things were, look at this graph. We see here that the packet loss at these ARPANET Milnet gateways, which a lot of mail was going by. Look at, look at the level of, of packet loss there. 4%, 6%, 8%. Look at the peaks. This is classic congestion collapse. They have congestion. Why did they have congestion? Because the routing protocol was oscillating. The routing protocol had a metric, hop count. And the hop count from any one destination or source to any of several destinations was the same going by different gateways. So the gateways are oscillating back and forth. Learn the lesson. Um, did you know you can buy TCP? You can buy it in Britain. It's a mouthwash. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. I've got a bottle. It smells like iodine. Do you have a Yeah, I have one. <laughs> I got one. I didn't love it, but I got one up there. Here are some of the things we learned. Uh, I'll, I want to concentrate on the lessons we learned in the limited time I have here. And what we had discovered was that the IPTCP suite operating over different kinds of nets behaved in markedly different ways. We thought we had a handle on how to build TCP. We actually uh, deployed it and found some disasters. One of them was my SACnet. SACnet was, and I think I have a diagram here. There's SATNET. It used one of the Atlantic satellites. The satellite had a hemispheric coverage. That is, if you sent a message to the satellite, it would rain down on the entire hemisphere. That's important to point this out. So the experiment had uplinks 
in the US, the UK, eventually Germany and Italy, and in Norway. These uplinks would send messages, packets, to the satellite. The satellite would then send messages and packets back down that all the satellites, all the Earth stations could hear. These were commercial Earth stations. These were Earth stations used for telephone. We hijacked one of them, one, one channel, and used that for our experiments. 64 kilobits was the, was the data rate. So we'd send a packet up to the satellite. It would rain down to all the Earth stations. I won't go into the details of that system, but there's some very interesting protocol features about that. That was the experiment. The fact is, however, that that experiment was using a commercial satellite with its attendant error rate, which wasn't too high. But the satellite was intended for telephony. We're using it for data. We learned the difference between a satellite for data and a satellite for tele telephony. The data was much more critical. The packet sizes were very small, 256 octets. Well, most everything we send is longer than that. So we segmented the message. As you see in the IP standard, we have segmentation and reassembly is part of the standard. And we certainly use that with the SATNET. But you see, the problem was, if you lose one fragment, you have to retransmit the whole thing. So you see, a packet loss is extremely important to IPTCP. If you start dropping packets, you drop the whole message. You've got to retransmit the whole thing. The lesson we learned there is fragmentation considered harmful. It's better to take an inefficient transmission, at least in a high error rate environment, than it is to segment. We learned the lesson again in packet radio. We learned the lesson again in wireless. And the lesson we can learn today, you don't want to fragment. So this is the SatNet system. The lesson we learned on the system was the importance of, of not fragmenting in the case of noisy systems. We learned a few more points, too, not the least of which in this system was politics. Remember, at that time, the satellites were for, date, for, for, for telephone. There was no data in the satellites. It was all telephone. Some TV, but it was all telephone. That's, that's of course, now all gone. The telephone is underneath the sea right now in fiber optic. What are satellites for today? There's only one application for satellites today, commercial satellites. Only one. There is no other. That's TV. So anything you do with a commercial satellite today is TV, otherwise nothing. Now this is part of the measurement program, and I'm not going to say too much detail about that. Uh, here is the issue about the TCP IP reassembly scheme. There are two kinds here. One way is if you lose a fragment, retransmit the entire system, the, the entire message. The other way, practiced in only one machine, the so-called TOPS20 machine years ago would retransmit just the fragment because it kept track of the fragments. We don't do that today. That's OK. But the lesson was learned here. If you have a high error rate, you really want to be very careful what you retransmit and be able to use the fragments you already have. Just retransmit the one that you don't. Here is a lesson about retransmission timeouts. This was before Van Jacobson. There are two extremes here. This shows the actual round trip delay. That's the bottom line down here. This shows the retransmission timeout computed from that delay. You take this delay, you average it, multiply by a factor, and that becomes the retransmission timeout. Here is a retransmission. Over here is a different underlying technology. This is an ordinary ARPANET line. This is a statistical multiplex line across the Atlantic. It was run by Ford Motor. And I had, a, I had a chance to experiment with that line uh, using TCP IP. I discovered to my horror that that line had a tremendous jitter. Look at this jitter here. This is the underlying jitter. It's tremendous. And I discovered that TCP IP retransmission timeout doesn't work. It's easy to fix it. Don't even worry about what I said down here. It's easy to fix. There's the estimate at the top up there. You can see it's very hazardous. So we learned two things. We learned the, 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 the expense of segmentation and reassembly, and we learned the expense of getting the retransmission timeout wrong. This is a very interesting result. I got, I got a lot of mileage out of this. Because most of, you, most of you know that I spend a lot of time in, 
computer network timekeeping. So I have a lot of experiments and results and technology in that area. But what I have here is to say, let's say that I send a packet and I timestamp it. I send it to you, you timestamp it, you send it back to me. From those timestamps, I can construct the round trip delay and the clock offset. I plot them here. I call this a wedge diagram. Here is the delay and here's the offset. Do a bit of math and you can see that the result has got to be a wedge. I can tell you what the, the slope of, those, of, the, uh, of the limbus lines in that are. You can see that the dots here represent individual round trip measurements that must be inside the wedge. Fine, good deal. I came across this. The ARPANET was congested. Something bad was happening. Nobody knew what was going on. So I did some experiments. I did the wedge diagram. And I got this. Okay. How do I interpret that? Well, in the ARPANET, there actually was a satellite assist. It was the ARPANET itself. The ARPANET was overloaded. We had to find some additional traffic. They managed to get a satellite channel. So the packets should go either by the satellite or the landline but shouldn't oscillate between the two. Guess what? See these little points here? They represent the point where here is all the, both paths are via the landline, here is one path is by landline, and the other is by the satellite, and here is where both trips, the trips are by the satellite. Little <coughs> measurements like that can reveal very sensitive things. Perhaps the part that I am most, I wouldn't say well known, but I, I think the part that I had the most in influence in was the autonomous system model. I've got a lot of slides here that I won't get a chance to get into today. But sometime else, I might spend a good deal of time philosophically saying, what's going on here? Realized we were at the stage in development where the ARPANET was stable, packet radio was stable, satellite was stable, the IP TCP protocols were stable. It works! 1982. It all works. We have to get large. We have to get very large. Today, we are really large. But back then, I was the chair of the Internet Architecture Task Force. And my job was to, was to identify and resolve issues about getting large. I was terrified. The growth curve was going like that. And the machines, the gateways, the infrastructure, I thought, wouldn't work. We had a thousand networks. We were going possibly at a hundred networks per week. I said, we're going to run out of storage. We have, to, we have to rethink the entire paradigm of having every gateway have the complete network database. You can't do that. We have to have scaling. The way of scaling was to say, to invent something called autonomous systems. My name. I wrote the RFC. My thought was we have to segment the system so we have something which somehow is a community model. It's like the campus. And the campus should be responsible for transport within its, within its borders. Then we have to connect these, these communities together. So now instead of having network routing, we have two different kinds of network routing. We have intra-network routing and inter-network routing. The inter-network routing was a, was a topic of the autonomous systems. So what is an autonomous system? And I thought about that. My conclusion was not popular. I said, you're not allowed to ask anything about an autonomous system. It may send you packets, you may send it packets. But you can't ask what's inside. But you can require one thing, that you must sign in the contract. If you're an autonomous system, you must be able to turn off the lights. That's the only administrative requirement you have. You must pull the wire. If somebody contacts you and says something bad has happened, you've got to be able to turn off the lights. That's the only thing the autonomous system has to do. As a very practical matter, the autonomous system consisted of gateways. We thought the gateways should be uh, homogeneous. We thought the gateways should uh, all be from the same manufacturer. They should all run the same routing protocol. They should be a well-understood concept. The University of Delaware would run a particular routing protocol in a particular manufacturer's equipment, and we would, we would characterize that equipment, we would know that equipment, we would know how it interoperates. Between these islands, autonomous systems, we would have uh, uh, inter-domain gateways. 
exterior gateway protocol would be used to connect them together. I'm the author of that protocol. I thought a lot about how to design that protocol. That protocol is no longer used. It's been supplanted by the border gateway protocol. I talk elsewhere in this talk much more about EGP and BGP. That's a, a, a political experiment in its own right. The fact was that the issues of the autonomous system model was to ensure stability. Stability was a very, uh, a very elusive scheme. And I want you to go through this with me just for a couple minutes to see, in fact, how delicate this issue is. Remember, we were going from a little centralized routing system to a community of systems. And we worried about what this meant. One of the things we thought was completely unacceptable, if I have a packet within my system and I toss it to your system, I never want to see it again. So loops between adjacent systems or loops spanning more than one system were absolutely forbidden. We were terrified that, we would, that the routing protocols would form a loop and disrupt the universe. That's how we thought back then. So there were two adventures. The first adventure was what we call unicore routing. What that meant was we have one routing system we trust. It was operated for fee by both Barry and Newman. They were responsible to the government to be sure that that aspect of the infrastructure was reliable, was maintained, and was always working. All the other institutions, including me, were leafs from that route. We could route packets to each other in two different ways. We could do it backdoor. So if Delaware and Maryland, for instance, had a line, they could use that, no problem. But they couldn't tell anybody else about that line. And then, of course, we could route it via the core, which then both Barry and Eck Newman would take responsibility and would deliver it. And that was the extent of the Unicor model. Well, that, of course, never, never lasted practice. We did that as an experiment to see, in fact, can we ensure stability when we start growing the system to hundreds and hundreds of providers? Will the system be stable? That was the Unicor. Well, intermission. You probably recognize Dolly and the sheep and the clones. So this was the age of cloning. We had the technology in hand. It wasn't, things weren't all solved. We, were, we weren't comfortable that the, that the uh, protocol could be uh, exported. But this was the time when we were uh, cloning and turning up the gas. Well, here's the ARPANET to, uh, topology in 1986. Well, you can see the difference between this topology and the first one I showed you is dramatic. It's going away. Udell is in there, by the way. The first clone, the, the, not, there are very few people who know this fact, even within the government. But the first commercial clone of TCP IP was a network called Intelsat Intelpost. Intelpost, I, I tell you about this and I have to kind of laugh, it's pretty funny. Intelpost was an organization uh, founded by the US Postal Service, the Canadian Post, and the UK Post. They ran a satellite network the only function of which was you could put a facsimile submitted to Washington, D.C. They would scan it, transmit it via satellite, play it out in London, and, you could, and, a, and a courier next day would take that fax to wherever the destination was. Can you believe that? Can you believe that was once a commercial enterprise? You actually faxed the paper, transmitted it across the Atlantic, printed the paper, and then carried the paper to the destination. That was the world back then. It turned out that the software used to do that was derived from my software. Uh, there's the whole story behind that, but I, I won't bother you with that now. So that's why I got involved with my software. Uh, not many people know that the Interpost network was a TCP IP network, and it would do anything TCP IP would do. I had a gateway at Clarksburg, Maryland, I worked for ComSat at the time, and there was a gateway there. And I used it to, put, to send experiment traffic and to monitor things across that gateway. So Interpost was, in fact, part of the internet, the public internet. I think of, I, I, there are some people who, if they knew that now, would get really angry with me. But I had a gateway there, and you could get data back, back and forth across, across the, uh, the gateway. The, the panda shown there, 
That was University College London. They, they scanned that panda in. It's on my resources page. It's on the net now. Uh, we used that, that picture of the panda for years and years and years for experiments. Well, I want to be sure I don't get too far out of my whack here. The adventure continues. We got the system working. We've got it commercially deployed. We've got it in use by hundreds of campuses in this country and overseas. It's pretty, it's, it's becoming mature. But we still have this problem. We still have the problem about the Unicor Rudy. 1986, NSF decided it was time that we officially get the government going in TCP IP. This was a real milestone. See, up to this time, the internet was a DOD project. It was a, a darker project. It was perceived as being a darker project. NSF wanted it to become a, a mainstream, uh, NSF-blessed research infrastructure. So they funded a five uh, router network at the supercomputer centers at that time. And those centers were using a machine called the LSI-11, which ran my software, which is how I got involved. So my software was involved for a couple of years there, from 1986 to 1988. Um, I spent most of that two-year period sleeping on the floor of the family room close to a telephone. I learned a lot. It was an invaluable opportunity to learn what happens and how you deal with network meltdown. That network is close. It's 56 kilobit circuits behind Cray XMPs, behind Cray 2s, behind CDC 7600s. We've got the elephants and the mice. Literally, elephants and mice. So I had a, a a very interesting experience. Now, at this point, we had the NSF-centric routing, and we had the ARPANET-centric routing. We had two cores. So how do we deal with the two cores? Well, I've got a slide here. Uh, you can read this later. This is the backbone uh, network. The lesson I learned, I call septic routing. We've got a septic tank. Stuff rolls downhill, right? We're being taped, so I won't say what that word is. The fact was that the septic tank was the ARPANET. It was the lowest level. So <coughs> if you sent a packet someplace, and it got to the backbone, this is now the NSF backbone. If the NSF backbone couldn't know where to put this, it just drop it into the ARPANET. The ARPANET would find whatever path it could find, and it would come up out of the sewer up to the destination host. So you see, the point making here is that there, there, there is an ultimate, uh, an ultimate routing infrastructure. We try to keep the routing as close to the leaves as possible, avoiding all of the extra traffic down below. But if we don't know where to put stuff, we'll send it down below. So you see, ignorance flows uphill, wisdom flows downhill. That's the lesson we learned. You need a multi-level rooting strategy in which nearby places are rooted at the top of the tree and faraway places are rooted at the bottom of the tree. And that's what I call septic rooting. That's what we have today. There are two places in this country called Fix East and Fix West. One's in Moffett Field, California, the other's in, in Rossland, Virginia. If you don't know where to put the packets, send them there. They know everything. But you hardly ever have to go there, because you'll find some nearby place to send the packet to that knows much more how to get shortly to the destination rather than send it down to the sewer. That's the lesson we learned. You might, you might think today is kind of stupid. We, of course we ought to know this. But as I said in the first slide of this, if you're up to your ass in elevators, if you don't know you're there to drain the swamp. Richard M. Nixon. Well, Later, look at this slide. There's something very important on this slide. It develops a rooting metric to avoid, root, uh, to avoid roots, uh, to avoid loops. And here's another lesson. I call this fallback rooting. What this does is you do the following. This sounds like a very ambitious thing to do. You look at the following. You look at the network. You look at all of the multiple connectivity. And you say, what happens if that link fails? And you then develop a rooting tree. What happens if that link fails? Develop a new rooting tree. 
do this for all of the links. You now have an engineered set of backbone routing table for each of possibly very many failures. If something fails, you put this root tree out of the closet, and plug it in, and you're well again. And that's what I hope to indicate by this slide. And we did this for the backbone group. You can't do it today. It's too briskly connected. But you see those, those two ideas. You engineer the rooting metric so you never get a loop, or you engineer all possible failures, and you select that particular rooting table based on what failure you detect. Oh, I think I'm not going to go too well. Well, okay, I guess I will. This is the story of the NSF backbone as I was struggling with it until it got to a point where I realized something drastic had to be done. And the result of that, and people have heard me say this before, is the secret to network success when things are falling down is to find the biggest elephant, elephant in the forest and shoot it and keep doing this until the forest is safe for mice. I've been often quoted as saying that. I believe it. I did this right here. At that point right, you can't see that. At this point right here, I put in selective preemption. Find the elephant, kill it. The elephant was that source that had the most storage in the buffers in the router. Find the customer with the most storage, that, that occupying the most buffer space, and, and shoot it. And keep doing that until the mice get through. Look what happened. All of a sudden, the congestion just went to zero. The, the supercomputers lost, but the casual telnet users survived. Uh, this is the NSF backbone network after the fuzzballs. The lesson to learn here, these are all fractional T1 services. We, we started out with 56 kilobit was the NSF backbone uh, capacity. 56 kilobits. You've got more at home today than we had in the entire network in 1986. 1988, we went to 1.5 megabits. Here was the actual physical connectivity, but that, this, this didn't look too well because there are too many places for it to fail. So this is the logical connectivity. How did you do the logical connectivity? You did what we call backhaul. You take one fiber and you dedicate it for two links. It's the same fiber as carrying two links. Logically speaking, we can build a very complex network, but physically speaking, we're stuck with the original. One day, some good old boy in the bayou in Louisiana saw this fiber running between, between poles. How do, you, how do you string fiber in the bayou? Do you bury it? I think not. You've got to put it in the poles. Good old boy with a shotgun. Pow! He shot it out of the air. Half of NSF went blank, went dark. But it was isolated. Part of the East Coast and the West Coast went dark. Part of the Midwest went dark, but other parts didn't. How could this happen? Because that fiber that the good old boy shot out of the sky was carrying multiple uh, uh, logical links. So what do you do? You learn to diversify. You learn to say, don't trust AT&T, don't trust MCI, use some combination of both, until you learn that MCI leases circuits from AT&T. Hello. <laughs> Here's what we learned from the NSF. I think we can safely leave that for study at some future time. But these are profound lessons. We learned that there's no such entity as a manager for the, for the internet. We had a meeting once. We were talking about the fact, who owns the internet? And we argued back and forth. I made an argument saying, it should be like the telephone system. Do you think something's interesting about the telephone system? You pick up a telephone and you can call anywhere in the world, right? Have you thought about the, the immense, interesting infrastructure fact about that? The telephone is ubiquitous. You can call anywhere. In any political division, there's nobody that says, you can't talk to Russia. There is something that says, the State Department says, for any official US government circuit, it may not transit Czechoslovakia. That is a true statement. It is true. I found out about that when I was part of the Network Technical Advisory Group for NSF. There were two rules the State Department had. Rule number one, no circuit transits Czechoslovakia. Number two, the Russians can't get access to our supercomputers. Those are the two rules that we had, that we had operating. 
So I, I thought that the, that the internet should be the same thing. And of course, it is today. And, and well, you, you can talk about the obscuring of certain websites, which the Chinese do. But in terms of telephones, my bottom was the internet should be like telephones. I had a lot of arguments against that. I said, a, a provider should not be able to advertise internet service unless that provider can provide connectivity to everywhere, possibly by a third party. And they said, no. A provider should be able to say, we are in business to serve San Jose, California. We can't reach anywhere else in San Jose, California. And that was the model of the ICCB at the time, that that would be a permissible thing to do. And I thought, and I think others came to believe this, and of course it's true today, that if you provide internet service, you can go anywhere. There are other lessons too, they're indicated there. A couple of words about the fuzzball, I've got about two minutes left. There's a fuzzball. The one on the left was on my home, I built it. The one on the right is in my basement. The one on the left is circa 1977, I think. The one on the right, as I say, was one of the last fuzzballs. They're just little LSI 11 machines, and I'm not going to spend much more time in this course talking, talking about it, but there's a story here. What it is, where it, where it came from, where it goes, it's, it's in the Internet Dictionary. Uh, it's in the Internet Handbook. It's, it's on the NSF website. Fuzzballs are a part of history. Last, I will go through this in a hurry. This is Internet Time Synchronization, which is kind of my baby. Uh, it has been for the last 25 years. So what can we do with this? A brief history here, there is a, uh, a, uh, an article in the press uh, in the Computer Communication Review, I think it was last, last July, where I have a whole paper on this. What, what is the history of NSF, or of, of uh, NTP? Uh, a brief history of NTP time, that's what it's called. Of course, you all know where it came from. A brief history of time? Who wrote it? Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, thank you. That's where I got the title. Uh, <laughs> I think this is interesting. I, I'll take a couple minutes to talk about this. This is time telling in 1979. How did you do this? Well, the machines were cheap. They didn't have crystal uh, clocks on them. You got the, you got the, the time from the from power mains. So uh, the, the, the time in the computer was determined by the power mains, 60 hertz. Well, this sounds like a terrible thing. Look at that time. It goes plus minus five seconds. This is, this is an August heating or cooling season. And so what happened was that the generators in the eastern grid would allow the, the phase to be decreased over the day when the demand was high, and they'd make it up at night. And you can see how they did it right there. So you see, the time was pretty terrible, but there was one thing that really was good, and that's the fact that the, that the eastern grid was phase synchronized. So even if the clocks drifted plus minus five seconds per day, they agreed with each other with any, without any further communication. We didn't have to synchronize them. They're already synchronized. All you had to do was to say, to set them at the same time, at the same value, and they would keep that time as long as the eastern seaboard, or the eastern grid was, was at the phase synchronous, and it was. So that's how well we were doing time in 1979. 1999, you can see some changes that have been made. Where if instead of five seconds, we're down to the nanoseconds. And that's what we can, we can do today. I think we probably, uh, we might, we wouldn't do too much better today unless we had very special equipment. Here's what we learned from the NDP development program. Among very many things, there are two things that stand out. The NTP subnet has about 25 million uh, servers today. 25 million. They're on every continent. At one time I thought, as, a, as, a, as the old radio ham that I am for 50 years, I like to work new countries with NTP. And I was hoping to get to the point some years ago where the sun would never set on NTP. And I got there. Now it never gets close to the horizon. It's, all over, it's in Antarctica. It's in space. It's on Mars. It's everywhere. The beauty of that is ubiquitous. And if you monitor the NTP subnet, you can tell a great many things are going on. And the NTP servers and clients will communicate with each other every few minutes, every 10 minutes or so. They'll, and they're always doing it. So we have a network sounding machine. I sound the network from the NTP servers. So you can tell how well the network works by just listening to NTP. <coughs> We've done several surveys with NTP. 
We can't do it anymore. There's no way you can do a survey anymore. It's politically incorrect and offensive to many. But we did it back then. Also, NTP, because it's watching the clock of a machine, can monitor very carefully the frequency of that clock, which varies as a function of temperature. So we have a thermometer, a globally distributed infrastructure thermometer. I've got a thermometer in every machine that NTP touches. Why is that good? Besides monitoring the, 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 the ambient room temperature. If anything goes wrong with that computer, if anything goes wrong with the air conditioning, NTP is the first one to pick it up. So NTP is a, a fire alarm. What is it? It's a global fire alarm. Well, where have we come? This is the master clock facility in the machine room downstairs. I want to point out here, look at the age of that equipment. That equipment is ancient. It's 20 and 30 years old. It's still ticking away. So that's what we have downstairs for our, our master time facility. And here, I won't say much more about it, but here is a selected uh, bibliography. You can see it online at my website. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of information is there. The one thing which you may have seen in the previous slide is there is an internet history project. It's hosted at the uh, website called www.postel.org. Does anyone know who Postel was? John Postel, good friend, very old friend, died a few years ago. He was the RFC editor. He's what, he is what made the RFC process work. One final comment I have here. As a research group, we've left tracks. From 1972, we have left tracks. The tracks are the Internet Engineering Note series, which is now defunct. The tracks are the Request for Comment series, which is very much alive. We're into almost 4,000 RFCs. The history of the project is traced by the Request for Comments publication series, of which there have been almost 4,000 since 1972 or so. Most of the work has been reported in journals, but the journals are tip of the iceberg. You want to know what's behind the panel. What were they talking about? What was not done? What, was, what were the suggestions that were made that were not followed up? Besides this presentation, which tells you something about the history in the area that I'm concerned with. You see, there's a whole stuff that describe everybody else's ideas. I have only one corner of the universe here. There's a whole bunch of stuff out there with others. 